war, death, loss. It's not as simple as fun as turning on the newest first person shooter and running around without a care, shooting and killing and dying and respawning. There's no reprieve from death. Real world, you don't get shot in the face and live. You don't get to pick your perks to survive explosions. The series that I'm doing is to give thanks to those that have served before us, are currently serving now, or may serve in the future. A lot of times, true hero stories can get buried in mainstream media. You'll hear about the water skiing squirrel or the latest political scandal before you hear about the soldier diving on a grenade to save his buddy or running blindly through a hellstorm of enemy fire to drag a fellow soldier to safety. These heroes, these stories that I'm doing, they're not always going to be an American because a hero is not relegated to a country, a culture, or a political mindset. In the background, you're going to see some COD gameplay to keep you somewhat entertained, but pay attention to the stories that will unfold and be explained in graphic detail. Today, I'm bringing you the remarkable, heroic, and courageous actions of one Staff Sergeant Salvatore Gunta, the first surviving Medal of Honor recipient since Vietnam. Now, you may or may not know that the Medal of Honor, while it's also a video game, is in this case the highest military award presented in the United States. It gets no better than that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Sergeant Gunta was born and raised in a small Midwestern town in Iowa. He was a Subway sandwich artist when he decided to enlist in the United States Army. On his second deployment in three years, and now these deployments, these aren't uh, three-month deployments, these are 365 days in war, in battle, in shitty conditions, bad weather, anything you can think of, these guys are going through it. So on his second deployment in three years, he was deployed to Afghanistan to a place called the Korangal Valley, which was a hotly contested six by one mile stretch of terrain near the Pakistan border. To US soldiers, it was known as the Valley of Death. The stretch along the Pakistan border was so dangerous, soldiers would not go to the bathroom until nighttime in order to prevent enemy fire on their position. On the day Sergeant Gunta proved himself worthy of the highest military honor possible, he was on the last day of a six day offensive in order to take control of the area. The five previous nights, Sergeant Gunta and his team had been sleeping in ditches 8,000 feet up in the mountains in October. What happened that fateful day follows is read by the United States President Barack Obama. Then Specialist Salvatore A. Gunta distinguished himself by acts of gallantry at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a rifle team leader with Company B, 2nd Airborne Battalion, 503rd Infantry Regiment during combat operations against an armed enemy in the Korangal Valley, Afghanistan, on October 25, 2007. When an insurgent ambush force split Specialist Gunta's squad into two groups, he exposed himself to enemy fire to pull a comrade back to cover. Later, while engaging the enemy and attempting to link up with the rest of his squad, Specialist Gunta noticed two insurgents carrying away a fellow soldier. He immediately engaged the enemy, killing one and wounding the other, provided medical aid to his wounded comrade while the rest of his squad caught up and provided security. His courage and leadership while under extreme enemy fire were integral to his platoon's ability to defeat an enemy ambush and recover a fellow American paratrooper from enemy hands. Now I'm going to break down uh, exactly what happened in Sergeant Gunta's and his squad's words. Uh, shortly after nightfall on October 25, 2007, Rifle Team Leader Gunta and the rest of the 7 troops at 1st Platoon had just finished a day-long overwatch of 2nd and 3rd Platoon in the valley below. So these guys are at about 8,000 feet, 2nd and 3rd Platoon are, you know, above sea level but below them in the valley below and they're providing basically an overwatch ensuring their safety. Uh, they were walking about 10 to 15 feet apart as they are walking through the forest and they had just left their position about, you know, 100 feet after leaving their position. 10 to 15 insurgents, there's no, you know, true accurate number, uh, ambushed the main body of the squad from cover. Now, the Taliban, they were covered and concealed, laying in wait for the American soldiers to walk past them. Uh, it was so close, this firefight was so close that while uh, Sergeant Gooden and his team had air support, the Apaches overhead could not fire because they did not want to risk, you know, friendly fire. They couldn't pin place it. So, uh, the ambushing force, they were armed with AK-47 assault rifles, 10 RPG launchers, and 3 belt-fed PK machine guns. Now, when you get these stats and you get this information, the only way to tell that information is based on what's left, you know, at the battle. It doesn't mean that these guys didn't run away with their weapons, okay? Uh, there, there could have been much more than that. But 
as we know right now, AK-47s, RPGs, and belt-fed PKM machine guns, uh, lighting these soldiers up from 30 feet away. Uh, as Sergeant Gunta described it, there were more bullets in the air than stars in the sky. A wall of bullets at every one at the same time with one crack, and then a million other cracks afterwards. They're above you, in front of you, behind you, below you. They're hitting in the dirt early. They're going over your head, just all over the place. They were close, as close as I've ever seen. Now, the, the one difference here, the one oddity, is that while the weapons were po probably standard, basically standard for, you know, these type of engagements, was that the Taliban were firing tracer rounds. So these guys are 8,000 feet up in the mountains at night, and they are letting loose with these belt-fed machine guns and AK-47s, and they're firing tracer rounds. Now, tracer rounds are basically like lasers, okay? They're just, they light up the sky. They have a trail. They have a trace of light, okay, if that makes any sense. So that was, that was very odd. And it's also very helpful that Sergeant Gunit and his squad did not need their night vision goggles because the one or two seconds that it took for them to, to hit the ground when they were, you know, got lit up might have been different if they had those night vision goggles on and got blinded. Sergeant Joshua Brennan was a leader of ALF team and he was one of Gunta's best friends. He was also walking point. He was, also, he was followed by Specialist Frank Eckrod, Squad Leader Eric Gallardo, and then Gunta, who was then a specialist. Uh, PFC Casey and Clary followed Gunta, a 13-man headquarters unit led by Lieutenant Wynn, including a five-man gun team along with a nurse who volunteered for the mission, followed immediately behind them. When the Taliban opened fire, Brennan was struck by eight rounds, and Eckrod was hit by four. Gallardo attempted to sprint forward, but RPGs exploding among the trees, along with the machine gun and small arms fire, stopped him. Unable to advance, he fell back to join Gunta's Bravo team. While backpedaling and firing at the same time, he fell and was in the same moment struck in the helmet by an AK-47 round. Gunta saw Gallardo take that bullet to his head, and assuming he'd been shot, ran out, with no cover to try to rescue the soldier. Uh, when he discovered that he was alive and he was uninjured, uh, he attempted to pull him back to safety. That was when he was hit with a bullet in the chest and a bullet in the back. Now thankfully, uh, nothing penetrated because his protective vest and the ceramic plate on his chest prevented the bullet from penetrating. And the SMAWD was on his back, which also protected him from getting shot. Um, he immediately he discovered or realized that the heavy tracer fire was coming not just from the west but from the north. Basically, they would walked into a classic L ambush. Uh, now you guys will have seen the graphics on the screen and you can kind of understand how this is basically instant death walking in here. If these guys had not reacted as fast as they had, they wouldn't have made it out of their alive. So, they started uh, tossing RPGs, preventing them from flanking them and putting as much cover fire as possible. Then what happened was, as they were getting cover up and providing security for each other, they noticed that uh, Sergeant Brennan was not where they thought he would be. Sergeant Gunta runs out and chases the retreating Taliban and sees that he's being dragged away. Sergeant Brennan's being dragged away by two Taliban. Uh, he me immediately engages them, kills one, which ended up turning out to be Muhammad Tali, which was a high interest target, and the second one dropped Sergeant Brennan and took off running. Uh, immediately, Sergeant Gunta attempted to uh, provide, you know, first aid as much as possible, but uh, they did as much as they could, but Sergeant Brennan died the next day. Uh, later, an AC-130 gunship, uh, yeah, from Modern Warfare 2, you guys know it, uh, was circling overhead and saw that Taliban that had escaped uh, was, car was running away Sergeant Brennan's backpack and was able to kill him. Specialist Eckrode later said of Sergeant Gunta's actions, for all intents and purposes, with the amount of fire that was going on in the conflict at that time, he shouldn't be alive. And basically to close this out, this is what Sergeant Gunta said about all the attention that he's been receiving. I'm not at peace with the attention at all. And coming and talking about it and people wanting to shake my hand because of it, it hurts me because it's not what I want. And to be with so many people doing so much stuff and then to be singled out and put forward, I mean everyone did something. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a fucking hero. Ha 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 ha, nummies. Get pooped on.